Greetings Earthlings! This is part 3 of my series on mental health and personal development, where I share perspectives, practices, and resources that have helped me towards a path of healing from a culture of trauma. In this video, I'll explore Eastern perspectives, specifically through a lens of Buddhist spirituality and systems of thought. It'll be a superficial overview, touching a lot of key concepts and beliefs that have helped me not only shift my perspective, but also build emotional intelligence and resilience. Quick disclaimer, I am not a therapist. I am certainly not a guru um, or a spiritual guide like an ordained monk. However, I am a student of Buddhism and a lay practitioner. I've been studying Tibetan Buddhism, specifically the Mahayana path, I'm happy to share what I've learned through Buddhism, and I hope that you find some of this helpful and insightful. All right. So what is Buddhism? Buddhism is a religion, and just like Christianity is separated into many different types of Christians, Buddhism has many different kinds of Buddhists. The one thing that all Buddhists have in common is that they follow the Dharma, or the teachings of the Buddha. Dharma are the instructions given by Buddha himself, the goal of the Dharma is to teach people how to heal and end all suffering. So who was this guy, the Buddha? So the Buddha was a real person and a serious spiritual seeker. And in my opinion, Buddha was a pragmatic ethical genius because he figured out a middle path for attaining liberation from suffering and also developed practices and systems of thought that allow people to gain powerful spiritual realizations through his teachings. His story is really fascinating, and I highly recommend anybody who's interested in learning about Buddhism to just learn about the Buddha's story. I'm gonna link a video in the description. It's a BBC documentary, which is one of my favorite interpretations of the Buddha's story. The Buddha goes by many names, and his story can have different variations, but it generally has the same sort of essence to it. The Buddha was a prince, born into a royal family, lived in extreme lavish luxury and privilege. However, like many humans who suffer the ailments of the human condition, he felt that something was lacking or missing in his life and could never be satisfied. Could you imagine just being like a, a prince? Like, Actually, most of us can't imagine the kind of luxury that he was experiencing. Basically, every desire, every Thing he ever wanted was available to him and I imagine that being surrounded with such you know material wealth but feeling spiritually empty would create a sort of identity crisis or some kind of spiritual crisis in a person and that's exactly what happened to the Buddha so it's very interesting the story of the Buddha and how that serves as sort of a metaphor for the Dharma itself and the teachings of the Dharma. So I highly recommend just looking into the Buddha's story of his life and the legacy that he left behind. And that will give you a lot more insight into the religion when you look at its founder. One of the first teachings that the Buddha ever gave was that of the Four Noble Truths. So the first of the Four Noble Truths is that suffering and dissatisfaction are inevitable. They are a fact of life. The second one is the true origins of suffering, and we'll get into that later in the video. Third is that the end of suffering is possible. And the fourth is the path to ending all suffering is known as the Eightfold Path. So there's more steps there. <laughs> there's more homework there, guys. You're not done. You thought it was just four? Nah, we got eight for you. Okay, but before we get into more of that, let's get into some basic concepts and terminology that are important to understand that relate to how Buddhist systems of thought work and the foundational beliefs behind Buddhism because we need to be able to understand how Buddhists see the world in order to be able to shift our perspectives. The next thing we should talk about is samsara. Samsara is our world right now. We live in samsara. We experience intense suffering, there's war, there's violence, there's famine, immense disparities in wealth. We also experience great pleasures in samsara too. And it's interesting because this dichotomy between suffering and pleasure 
Samsara is symbolized as a world inside of the mouth of a demon god called Mara. It's interesting that Mara is the demon god of death, desire, and rebirth. I think it's interesting that Buddhists see desiring and suffering as one. Okay, another concept that we need to talk about is the idea of reincarnation and rebirth. Buddhists believe that you have lived many, many lifetimes, and this lifetime may not be your last. And you've also been many different kinds of creatures and beings. Basically, anything that moves about or seems to have like a consciousness is alive and is capable of being reincarnated. And you have been every single living creature at some point. You've been every gender. You've been in every realm. And so the realms in Buddhism, I won't go into too much detail, but basically you have higher realms and lower realms. The lower realms are where animals and unfortunate beings are reincarnated into. Humans exist in the higher realms, and humans, interestingly enough, are the only ones who can achieve enlightenment. I'm sure you've heard this word, enlightenment. In Buddhism, it has a very specific meaning. An enlightened being is someone who has escaped samsara, and Buddhas are enlightened beings. And because reincarnation is a thing, and in the higher realms, the only ones who can reach enlightenment are humans, the human life is very precious. The way I heard it described to me, in your reincarnations, through all your lifetimes, the chance of being born as a human are so slim. There's a story that helps kind of shed light into this idea of a precious human life in Buddhist. Imagine a vast ocean and imagine a ancient turtle that sleeps at the bottom of the ocean. Now, on the ocean surface, imagine a lay of flowers floating around on a vast ocean. And this ancient turtle comes up only once every 10,000 years to take a breath of air. Of all the beings that exist in the world, the chances of you being born a human are so rare, it's like this ancient turtle coming up for air once every 10,000 years, and that lay of flower being perfectly positioned for that turtle to poke its head right through it. And I thought that was just such a powerful visual, like wow, it really... It really, it's quite out there, but it also gives perspective on how precious the human life is in a Buddhist perspective. The human experience is defined by a lot of suffering, confusion, often overwhelming desire and want. To be in a state of wanting is to be in a state of suffering. We always want what we don't have, and then once we have it, we want more. <laughs> We're not satisfied. But because humans are the only ones who can achieve enlightenment, we have an amazing opportunity in our lifetime to actually reach enlightenment by practicing and following the Dharma. The next concept I want to introduce you to is delusions. Delusions are thoughts and beliefs that we hold. Deluded views take us away from that natural state of compassion and altruism. And Buddha said that the ultimate delusion is this idea of the self and the self-grasping. So self-grasping and self-cherishing is this belief that my mind and my happiness are the most important thing in the world. The Buddha taught that self-cherishing is the root of all suffering. That's because the self does not exist. Our consciousness does though. Our consciousness gets attached to a physical vessel of the body and that body this body that I'm in right now is the vessel that my consciousness is attached to. Impermanence is the idea that nothing lasts and everything changes. Nothing will last forever. Your body will age. You will grow old and you will die. That nothing is forever. The Buddha said that compassion comes from understanding impermanence. A bodhisattva is someone who has gained tremendous spiritual realizations but has given up enlightenment in order to stay in this realm of samsara in order to help others and they practice something called bodhicitta which is this universal compassion for all beings and they try to help 
by generating compassion and teaching people the Dharma. And I want to explain why you don't want to be reborn and why you want to reach enlightenment as quickly as possible. Let's talk about karma. Karma is a huge topic and I'm going to try to condense it because I think karma can also have a lot of misunderstanding to what it means. So the law of karma is a special instance of the law of cause and effect, according to which all our actions of body, speech, and mind are causes and all our experiences are their effects. Each person has a different individual karma. Karma is created by the intention behind every action. And karma can be accumulated across lifetimes. So every lifetime that you've been reincarnated, you've taken actions, and then those actions have created either positive or negative karma. We have all caused harm. No matter who you are, you have harmed someone in your lifetime. Admit it, don't act above it. You have definitely harmed someone. So if you've done a lot of bad things in your life, you're probably going to experience more negative karma. And it may not always show up in your lifetime. It might show up later in like, the, in like several lifetimes. And that's what's crazy about karma is like, it kind of explains why some of us experience like incredible suffering for no reason. I won't go too much further into karma. And it is pretty out there sometimes. But again, these are belief systems that can help with understanding the roots of suffering. And then you can develop practices to help you cope and heal. So next let's get into the Buddhist perspective on mental health and mental illness and how to heal that. Let's get into the Buddhist perspective on mental illness and depression. I recently attended a Buddhist talk specifically on this topic and I took lots of notes so I'm happy to share some of what I learned. So the normal responses to depression are often to sink further into the negative feelings. We often say things like, why am I like this? I shouldn't feel this way. You know, just beating ourselves up. The mental anguish that we experience, it's not your fault that you're depressed. Depression is arising in you because of the ripening of negative karma. Another thing that they talked about was that depression makes you very self focused. Our ego kind of takes over and hijacks our mind and, and we say to ourselves like, oh why me? And like, I am so depressed. It makes us focus on what we don't have, wishing that things were different from how they are. The Buddha said that self-cherishing is the root of all suffering. In a depressed episode or a, a depressed state, not only are we experiencing the ripening of our negative karma, but then it's actually making ourselves feel worse because now we're really self-cherishing in that moment. We're really in our own egos and allowing this negative karma to sort of ripen and create even more negative karma. And we might take actions that are not very good and create even more negative karma out of it. Do you see how it kind of creates like an infinite loop of like negative karma and then you take negative actions which create more negative karma. It's, just, it's, it's an infinite loop. So how do we get out of this? How do we stop? I know a lot of people who suffer from chronic depression may consider self-abolishing or suicide as an option. And you might think, well, if I'm just gonna be reborn, why don't I just, you know, myself and then I'll be reborn into another life and get a fresh start. <sighs> so Buddhists do not recommend suicide as an option to alleviate your suffering because what will happen is that all of the negative karma that you have accumulated will just be carried with you into the next lifetime. Remember that you have a precious human life. Remember how difficult it is to be born into a human life. You could have been born as any other creature, but you've been born into a human life, which is the only one that can actually attain enlightenment. You are in the only kind of being that can liberate yourself from suffering and you can help others as well. So take the advice from the Buddhists. Self-abolishing is not the way to go and it is definitely not going to fix your suffering because you're going to suffer more in the next lifetime. Wouldn't you rather just liberate yourself from samsara and 
be free of any suffering and then you could just be this energy that flows around the universe helping others. That's sort of what they're trying to get you to do is like realize that you don't want to be reborn actually because there's just going to be more suffering likely. So take this opportunity in your precious human life to liberate yourself and then you can help others as well. And I really like that about Buddhism is just like let's get to the root here. Let's end suffering. It's not about, you know, it's not about you. It's about everyone. We all need to be liberated. The world desperately needs you to heal yourself so that you can help others. Let's get into some Buddhist practices that allow us to heal ourselves and to liberate ourselves from suffering. One of my favorite Buddhist quotes is, if it can be fixed, then there is no point in being unhappy. If it cannot be fixed, then there is no point in being unhappy. Truly flawless logic. You can choose happiness in any situation. Our main problem is not, you know, a person or a situation that we find upsetting. Our main problem is that we're in the samsara. And those difficult people or situations that create the painful feelings that we think are creating the painful feelings, I should say, um, are a distraction actually because painful feelings don't come from outside of us they arise from within our own minds and our own mental karma okay next is learning not to retaliate anger is probably the most destructive of the three poisons in fact I was reading a Buddhist book where they talked about treating an angry person as if they're temporarily insane and you know having compassion for angry people or having compassion for people who are harming others because they're not only harming others but they're harming themselves they're creating their own negative karma that in itself will help purify some of your own negative karma rather than sinking into it and like getting into it with that person just fighting with them or something right that would create more negative karma so when a difficult person or situation arrives in your life it's an opportunity to practice patience and compassion the more difficult the person or situation, the more spiritual merit that you can accumulate. It will make you more resilient in the face of ever-increasing adversity. So instead of seeing someone as an enemy, Buddhists see difficult people as teachers. Teachers who will give us the training we need to develop this inexhaustible inner wealth. And in fact, I found this kind of difficult to understand at first, but some Buddhists teach to be grateful for suffering. And at first I was like, wait, 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 what? Be grateful for suffering? Like, I'm not, I'm not having a good time. Why should I say thank you for... But I understand it now. Our suffering is our greatest teacher. It allows us the opportunity to practice patience. And so Buddhists teach that you should show gratitude for when you're experiencing suffering because it's an opportunity to purify your negative karma. So we're gonna talk about a Buddhist practice that you've definitely heard about, and that is meditation. And so meditation is not just mindfulness. Although mindfulness does have wonderful benefits to allow us to gain control of our mind and not have runaway thoughts. So meditation in Tibetan Buddhism is holding very specific mental states for long periods of time to attain spiritual realizations. To meditate is to familiarize our mind constantly and thoroughly with a virtuous object. We contemplate Dharma to understand its meaning clearly and to gain conviction, testing it to see if it is logical and coherent, whether it makes sense in terms of our own experience and whether its purpose is worthwhile. I want to note that the Buddha discouraged blind dogmatic belief by saying, don't believe everything I say just because I said it. He encouraged individual self-exploration and critical analysis of his instructions of the Dharma. We use our imagination, mindfulness, and powers of reasoning until through the power of our investigation, a special thought or feeling arises. In Tibetan Buddhism, meditation is a practice that is very, very analytical. I won't go into it too much because there's countless resources that you can find online on meditation, especially on mindfulness. However, I do want to caution people about the mindfulness movement that's currently sweeping the world. Mindfulness and meditation without Dharma is a trap. For centuries, Buddhists have been warning people about the dangers of 
mindfulness meditation while ignoring the realities and the violence and the systems of oppression that exist in our world. These things that plague our reality have real impacts on people's lives and we should not ignore those. A lot of the mindfulness movement teaches people spiritual bypassing, which is essentially avoiding, ignoring, and meditating your problems away. Focusing on non-attachment under the guise of spirituality, and it's actually really harmful. We should be addressing these issues, and we should be talking about systems of oppression. We can't just meditate them away. And a lot of people are falling into this idea that you just need to meditate and you just need to practice mindfulness and everything's gonna be all Gucci, you know? Elliot Song did a wonderful video on this topic called Muck Mindfulness, which is actually a book as well. Muck Mindfulness When Capitalism Goes Buddhist. And I highly recommend watching that video. I'll put the link in the description. This book, Muck Mindfulness, it's all about the capitalist bastardization of Buddhism and how it's been co-opted by a lot of Westerners basically to turn a profit. And again, if you have meditation and mindfulness but you're not learning the Dharma, you can actually apply those things in very harmful ways and you can actually hurt more people. When you're not paying attention to the, the issues that plague our reality, you're actually avoiding and becoming delusional. <laughs> so yeah, I highly recommend watching the video by Elliot Song because I don't want any of my viewers to be spiritually bypassing, go to a spiritual retreat once and then come back as a self-proclaimed guru who's awakened and telling everybody to just meditate their problems away. Namaste. Namaste the hell away from me. I had to make that joke. I couldn't resist the urge. So yeah, I would just caution people about the mindfulness movement. If you don't have Dharma to guide you, if you don't have a spiritual guide to teach you and to help you stay on the path, it's very easy to get lost and follow a false guru. So be very careful about that. Lastly, the practices that we're learning today, the patient acceptance of suffering, learning not to retaliate, and generating compassion these are all practices that can help purify negative karma. Generating compassion is something that all people are capable of, but we need to practice it because our world does not encourage that. Our reality is very harsh and it encourages self-grasping and being very self-absorbed. Like we talked about earlier, depression can make you very self-focused. So a very simple solution to depression is actually helping others generating compassion for others, asking how can I help other people. Lastly, prayer is a practice that can help with depression. Buddhism teaches that prayer is the creation of positive mental karma, especially when you pray for the well-being of others. For example, choosing to pray for someone who is really difficult to work with, praying for that person's well-being is going to be more spiritually fulfilling than wishing them harm or taking actions that could cause them harm. You see what I mean? So if you can combine all of those things, patiently accepting suffering, non-retaliation, learning about the Dharma, practicing meditation and holding very specific states of mind, generating compassion, and praying, doing rituals that accumulate good merit and bring spiritual fulfillment to you, it will help you so much. I know it has helped me, and I hope that all of this information has been insightful and helpful to you. All right, we've talked about a lot of things, but I hope this was helpful. If it was, drop a prayer emoji in the comments and give this video a like. I hear that helps with the algorithm, and that helps me get this content out to more people. That's it, folks. Be sure to subscribe for more content, and I'll see you next time.